Take your Bibles and let's turn together to the book of Colossians chapter 2. We're going to read Colossians 2, 1 through 8. It's also going to be up here on the screen as well. The Holy Spirit is addressing the church through the writing of the Apostle Paul, specifically the church at Colossae. Um, But those words that were written to them then still hold that same valid truth for us this morning. Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. I want you to know that I'm contending for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not, not met me personally. That's us right here, isn't it? We haven't met the Apostle Paul personally, but he has something to say to us this morning. Verse 2, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, how did we do that? We talked about it in our Sunday school class this morning. By grace, through faith, in Christ. That's how we receive Christ. In the same way, continue to live your lives by faith, through grace, I mean, by grace, through faith, in Christ. Continue to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depend on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Before I go any farther, let me just deal with that last phrase, the elemental spiritual forces of this world, because you read that and you go, what is that? What what are we talking about there? The elemental, because you think the elemental forces, you know, you think about maybe scientific stuff, uh, but then it says spiritual. How is it elemental and spiritual at the same time? The Greek there is stoichion. Stoichion. It means elemental or things that fall in the natural order. Literally the ABCs of things, the one, two, threes of things. He said there's guys that are going to try to take you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophies. And they depend on two things, but both of them are human thinking, human traditions, and then these natural order of things thinking. The natural order of things thinking. If you're an underliner, I want you to underline verse 4. It's on the front of the bulletin today. That's going to be our theme verse for this sermon series. This sermon series that we're beginning today, a series that I'm going to call fine-sounding arguments. Verse 4 says, I tell you this so no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Paul writes to the church and he says, I've got some things to tell you. And my goal in telling you these things are multifaceted. I want to encourage you. I want to unite you and I want to deepen your knowledge of Christ in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge can be found. It's a higher wisdom. It's higher than human thinking. It's higher than our ways. It's past finding out. It's higher than human tradition. It's higher than elemental, the natural order of things, thinking that that comes through people here on earth. So that through that deception, you won't be taken captive by human philosophies built on these things even the prevailing science of the day which was that stoichion was another way of saying the prevailing science now in the greek world in the roman world that part of that was the uh, astrological they thought that the events on earth were controlled by the stars and heavens stuff some of that still goes on today this idea that things are in the control of the creation rather than in the control of the creator He says there's going to be teachers who try to shape your thinking and you might be taken captive by those things. As you, as you heard me read that Colossians 2 through uh, 2, 1 through 8, did you think to yourself, man, the same things that were happening then is happening now in the church today. So what we need is the same thing they needed. We need to be Deepened in our knowledge and our understanding. We need to be encouraged. We need to be united. And we need to be protected from fine-sounding arguments that the world's going to throw. And sometimes they even find their way into the church. 
Paul writes a similar thing in his letter to the Ephesians. In Ephesians 4, he's talking about the reason why spiritual gifts have been given to the church. And he talks about people in the church who have different spiritual gifts. And when we get to verse 12 and 13, here's what he says. These gifts and these these offices have been given to the church to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up, strengthened, until we all reach unity in the faith. That's the same thing he talked about in Colossians. And in the knowledge of the Son of God, same thing again. We need those same things. We need unity. We need knowledge. We need to become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then when that happens... We will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. That last phrase, cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful schemes. That's another way of saying fine sounding arguments, human philosophy, philosophies that depend on human wisdom. Now, if you were to, to talk about the church in America or the church in the West today, looking at that, Would we be more like verse 13, mature, unity, full of knowledge and faith? Or would we be more like verse 14, being tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every teaching and the cunning and craftiness of men? I'm afraid, as a whole, the church today looks more like 14 than 13. God wants us to be mature. He wants us to be in unity. He wants us to be in faith and in our knowledge of Christ. We know that the church is being assailed by the culture that we live in. That's always been true. It always will be true. But those attacks are often packaged as fine-sounding arguments, which makes sense because we wouldn't be led astray by a stupid-sounding argument, would we? A fine-sounding argument is something that goes, oh, well, you know, that kind of sounds right. That kind of sounds good. That kind of sounds something that, you know, is intelligent. Based on science, it's based on on these these things that seem right. They're presented in a way that sounds good. It sounds right. It sounds loving sometimes. Even it sounds helpful in ways that appeal to our emotions and our compassion. They appeal to our God-given sense of justice. They often point out, and sometimes rightfully so, some of the historical shortcomings of the church. Sometimes Christians are hypocrites. Sometimes Christians aren't very Christian in the way they voice their opinions. They're unloving. They can even be hateful. Sometimes the churches use methods that have hurt people. And often these fine-sounding arguments will take those shortcomings and conflate that into a reason to doubt and even abandon the truth of God. And we don't want to be labeled as hateful. We don't want to be hypocritical. And after all, we've all sinned. That's why I love the song that we just sang. He's holy. He's true. We're not. But he is. He is holy. We can become vulnerable to falling prey to arguments and ideas and pretensions and imaginations that appeal to all these human things that set themselves up against the knowledge of God. In other words, fine-sounding arguments. So these next few weeks, I'm going to try to tackle some of those fine-sounding arguments with you on Sunday morning, not so that we can say, see, we're right and they're wrong. That's not what this is about. But it is for the same reason that Paul wrote his letter, to encourage us, to unite us so that we can stand for the truth, not be puffed up with pride, but to be in the confidence and courage and competency that we talked about last two weeks in our FDI series, the competence that comes from Christ, that we can do what we talked about Wednesday night in our Wednesday night Bible study, contend for the faith. That's the words of Jude, the words that Paul used in Colossians. How hard I'm contending for you to fight for the faith. One of the motivations for those who are proliferating these fine-sounding arguments is a genuine heart to help people. It's a compassionate heart. But it's not rooted in the proper interpretation of Scripture. So while the intention might be good, the outcome is not. 
the outcome, the result, the fruit is pulling people away from God's truth, from God's perfect plan, and towards these plans of men that sadly exclude or redefine God's truth into something that ultimately doesn't help anybody. So that's where I want to begin today by combating this first fine-sounding argument, the first one in this series that's taking, taking root not only in the culture, not only in the world, but also in the church. It's a fine-sounding argument that diminishes the truth. Have you ever heard the term red-letter Christians? Oh, I'm a red-letter Christian. Doesn't that sound good? Of course it does. There's a growing number of people in the church who want to define themselves and actually define all of Christianity by the red letters. And by the red letters, what do I mean? I mean the words that Jesus spoke that we have in Scripture. Maybe you've seen a, a Facebook that looks a Facebook post that looks kind of like this. A guy holding up a, a blank sign and it, and it says on there, here's everything that Jesus said about abortion. And he does this. In other words, Jesus didn't say anything about abortion. Which I would say that's not actually true because Jesus talked a lot about life. But then he does this. Here's, here's everything that Jesus said about homosexuality. Nothing. Jesus didn't say anything about homosexuality. Well, yes, he did. He talked a lot about sexual immorality both in the Gospels and in the book of Revelation. But he didn't say that word out loud. Or he'll say, here's everything that Jesus said about other religions going to hell. Nothing. Well, again, that's not really true. Jesus did talk about that. But maybe he didn't use those words specifically. But the idea is, since Jesus didn't talk about it, it's not valid. Now, at first glance, being a red-letter Christian sounds really good. I mean, who wouldn't want to define themselves by the teachings of Christ? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? We're followers of Jesus. How could you go wrong being a red-letter Christian? Well, there's several ways you can go wrong being a red-letter Christian. The first is called making an argument from silence. And any high school debate coach will tell you that will not fly in a debate. You can't make an argument from silence. You can't say, well, because this guy didn't say anything about that, then we know everything is okay because he didn't talk about it. How many of you have had a, a, a kid use that one on you? Mom, I know you said I can't talk on my phone, but you didn't say I can't text on my phone. You never said that. I know you said I can't watch the, the horror movie Scream, but you didn't say I couldn't watch Scream too. I mean, you never said it, so it must be okay, right? I mean, as teenagers, we probably all pulled that trick, and we're, we're trying to do that with Jesus. Well, Jesus never said this, so it must be okay. No, that, that, that won't work, but that's really that's just a little common sense that you can apply to this situation and say, well, okay, that doesn't work, but here's the big problem with I'm a red-letter Christian. It's not in what it includes. Of course, including the words of Christ are wonderful. They're all true. They're all helpful. They will make us a better person. It's in what it excludes. It's in what it excludes. It excludes or devalues or reinterprets all the non-red-letter words of Scripture using only the red-letter words as a sieve to pass everything through. In other words... I'm going to take everything else that's said in Scripture, and if I can't find some red-letter words to validate it, then it's not valid. If I can't some, find some red-letter words that say it says applies to me, then it doesn't apply to me. This week, as I was researching this topic, I came a, across a, a, a Google thread. This was this, a guy really asked this question. He said, "Hey, isn't there some place that I can buy a Bible that only contains the words of Jesus?" Yeah, there is. I've got it right here. This only contains the words of Jesus. All of them. All of them. Because every one of them in here is from him. You see, it's impossible to understand and interpret the red letter words of Jesus without the context of all of Scripture. 
Without the context of all of Scripture, you pull Jesus out of context. You pull him out of his Jewishness. You pull him out of his history. You even pull him out of his prehistory. That he was God. That he is God. That he was there before creation. You not only pull out, pull Jesus out of his context, you pull all the other people who were his original hearers out of their context. How would they have understood the, these words that, that Jesus was saying? They would have understood it in their culture and in their history. And with all that shared Jewishness and, and Israel-centric and Jerusalem-centric understanding of how things work. It's impossible to properly interpret what Jesus is saying when you take away all that context, which makes it easy then to twist those words and make them say something that Jesus didn't mean rather than to let him say what he was really saying. But perhaps the most harmful thing of that philosophy is this. It divorces what Jesus said from what Jesus did. It takes the life of Jesus and says that it's the teachings of Christ. Well, it is the teachings of Christ. But how do you understand the teachings of Christ without understanding the greater context? In other words, how can you understand the cross without understanding about the blood and the blood sacrifices and the blood atonement and the reason for the shedding of blood? How can you understand anything about salvation without a proper understanding of sin, which comes from a proper understanding of a holy God and what this holy God requires? And he teaches us what sin is and what sin costs. A God who shows both justice and mercy, who reveals both his love and his wrath. How can you understand the why behind why Jesus said everything he said? And the answer is you can't. You can't divorce what Jesus did from what Jesus said. And you can't divorce the teachings of Christ from the purposes of God. Because God's purposes wasn't just to give us a new red letter policy book. Well, we had this old black letter policy book and we couldn't do that. So here's a new policy. You ever get a new policy book at work? When the boss comes and says, you know, all those policies we had, well, here's the new revision, here's the updated, and here's all these supersede all these, so this is going, so now put these into practice. The ultimate purpose of God was not to give us a new policy book, the, the purpose of God was to give us Himself, to bring us into a relationship. The one who has been with you, He will be in you. To give us a heart transplant. To take out our stony heart and put in a a heart of flesh on which he could write his word and give us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. To transform us. To enable us to have a real internal, personal relationship with God. Because we couldn't keep the black letters. We also can't keep the red letters. He didn't replace one legalistic system with a different legalistic system that's easier to do. The red letter folks would say that for centuries the, the, the Christian church has been too focused on the goal of getting people to heaven. Which to me sounds like a pretty good goal when that's what Jesus told us to do. Go and preach the gospel. They would say we're trying to They would say that they are trying to make the earth more heavenly by addressing the problems here on earth that the church seems to have forgotten. The social justice issues, the racial justice issues, the poverty and the inequality and the discrimination, which is a sin issue, are sin issues. And it's great to address those things, but they are symptoms of, of a disease, and the disease is called sin. At the root of those very real problems is one problem, and that one problem is what the entire Word of God is focused on giving us the answer for, and that problem is the sinful heart of man that took place in Genesis 3 when they fell. And the whole rest of the story is about how we can fix that problem. And that Fixing that problem is the only thing that will fix the cultural problems. 
the other problems in our society, the ones that maybe in our church we might be more inclined to talk about, to think about, the horrors of abortion, the degradation of sexual perversion and deviancy, and all the problems in our society that are created by those things. Are those real problems? Yes, they are. How should we go about addressing those problems? Well, we should be involved in our communities. We should be involved politically. There's, a, there's a, anybody see purple signs in people's yards? Talking, I'm going to start talking about that in the next couple of weeks. Something that we're going to vote on here in our state on August the 7th. We should be involved in that. But that's not going to fix the problem because the issue is the same issue. It's the sinful heart of man. And there's only one thing that can, that can change the sinful heart of man. Jesus. We've got to be telling them the whole story, the full story of the gospel that heals and forgives and restores and redeems and does welcome all who will come. But it's not a story that can be fully told. It's not a story that can be fully applied with a, a partial gospel. A partial Jesus. A partial God. What do I mean by that? Saying, we want this part of God. We want this part of Jesus, but this other part we don't want to look at. We don't want to think about. We don't want to talk about. I like this part, and I'll live by this part. But those other words, I don't want to live by those words. You remember when Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted by Satan? We read about it in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. But let's let's look at Matthew chapter 4, 1 through 10. You don't have that? Okay, let me read it to you. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness and tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and said, Stand up here on the highest point of the temple. If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Isn't it interesting that the devil quotes Scripture? Uses Scripture. Twists Scripture. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put your Lord, the God, your, your, put the Lord your God to the test. Then the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, which he had the authority to do because he's the God of this age and he's the God of this world since Satan handed it over to him. I mean, since Adam handed it over to him. All this I will give you, he said, if you will just bow down and worship me. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to die. You don't have to wait. I'll give it to you now. I know the Lord's promised you all the nations of the earth, but I'll give it to you now. Just fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. And maybe you're saying right now, that is a, why did you bring us to this passage to show us this? Well, you already picked up on part of it. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. But let's think about this a minute. Why did Jesus go back and use those black letters when he was fighting well, fighting Satan? Why did he go back and use Scripture? I mean, if the red letters were more powerful than the black letters, Jesus could have just said to the devil, Devil, I'm God and you're not. Go jump in a lake of fire. But he didn't. He used the scripture just like we can to resist the devil. Not select words. We're to live by every word. He used Old Testament scripture. All scripture is God breathed. 2 Timothy 3.16. And it takes all the scripture to interpret any of the scripture correctly. They're all Jesus words because... Guess what? This is a, another principal doctrine that's under attack. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. And Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Now, do I understand all that? 
Can I explain it to where you can understand it? Probably not. But it's true. You know how I know? The Bible tells me. Jesus even tells me in the red letters. I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen him. I'm going to send you a counselor, and he's the same as me. And he has been with you, and he will be in you. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, and that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus, and that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, and that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of prophecy, and that the Spirit through whom God wrote the Scriptures as as holy men were carried along by the Spirit is the same Holy Spirit. That is the Spirit of God, that is the Spirit of Christ. You see, no words in this Bible carry more weight than others. They're all authoritative. They all came from God. They were all God-breathed. And they've been preserved by God and convey the heart of God. Don't chop up the Bible piecemeal and don't chop up the Trinity piecemeal because they're one. It's one story. So why do folks gravitate towards, I'm going to be a red-letter Christian? One, they, they, they haven't studied the Bible. But culturally speaking, they have trouble, they struggle with the Bible's portrayal of, of a God of wrath, of a God of vengeance, of a God of punishment, of a God who would send a flood and destroy every living being on the earth except the eight that were in the ark. They have trouble with a God who would send Joshua to wipe out the Canaanites, with a God who would send uh, first Joshua and then Saul, and Saul failed to wipe out the Amalekites. They have trouble with a God that would punish those who reject the gift of Christ forever in a place called hell. But they do like Jesus as the embodiment of love and mercy and grace and inclusion and he is all that. But he's not just that. He absolutely is that. Which means God is absolutely that. See, there's, there's this pitting of, of, of God against Jesus. That God's mean and Jesus is nice. And nice Jesus came to save us from mean God. Jesus is full of grace and mercy, but he's also righteous and holy and just. And those red letter folks forget that there's red letters in the book of Revelation. They have a really hard time with Jesus in Revelation because in Revelation, Jesus comes as a conquering hero. In Revelation, Jesus comes to punish the evildoers. And so they have to do something with Revelation to get around that. So they will allegorize it or they will spiritualize it or they say it was all fulfilled in AD 70. They have to explain away Revelation. Almost the whole book of if, if if you know if I was if I were the printer if I was the publisher I might publish the entire book of Revelation in the red letters because everything in there is the revelation of Christ and it's the revelation from Christ and everything that John sees is what Jesus says come up here and I I will show you what what soon takes place so everything that he's shown is being shown by Jesus now he uses the mouth of some angels and some other things but everything that's in there is is, is Jesus showing John what's going to happen and at the very end of it he says now I who testify that these things are true say behold I'm coming soon who's saying that Jesus But even yet, even if you open your Bible to Revelation, you'll see some red letters. It's tough for the red letter folks to read those because it says he's going to come as one who rules the nations with an iron rod. Who strikes down the nations with the sword of his word. Who treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. Who wears a robe dipped in blood. Folks, the robe that Jesus wears in Revelation 19 that is dipped in blood, that's not his blood from the cross. That's not the blood of the atonement. It's the blood of his enemies, who he's crushing when he returns. Now, Pastor David, why would you say that? Don't say that. People won't like that. 
How do you even know that? I know that because of the black letters tell me in Isaiah 63 when God gave Isaiah the exact same vision that he gave John in Revelation 19 and he sees the conquering warrior coming whose robe is dipped and it tells us whose blood it is. The red letters in Revelation say several times repent. Repent, turn away from your sin, or else I will come and pour judgment on you. Which is something that Jesus did say in the Gospels. In Luke 13, 3, he says, Repent, unless you repent, you will perish. In Luke, I mean, Revelation 2, 4, he says to the church at Ephesus, Repent. In Revelation 2, 15, he says to one of the other churches, Repent of your sexual immorality, or I will come and fight against you with the sword of my mouth. The next letter, to the letter of Thyatira, he says, Repent of your sexual immoralities, or I will, I will cause you to suffer intensely. That's Jesus saying that. The church at Laodicea, he says, Repent, or I will spit you out of my mouth. And at the end of the book, he says, Blessed are those who have the right to enter the heavenly kingdom. And we know who those people are from Jesus' words in the gospel. To as many as believed, to those who had received, to them he gives the right to be called the children of God. And right after he says, blessed are they who have the right to enter, he says, outside the gate are evildoers. Those who would not turn from their sin. Those who hold to falsehood. Is Jesus inclusive or not? Sure he is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth shall not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever will may come. All are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Do you remember the two parables he told about the banquets? The master gave a banquet. It was wonderful. He wants everybody to come in. In fact, he sends his servants out and he says, go and bring them in. And the people who were invited, they didn't want to come, but go and get the other people. Then go and get the blind and the lame and the sick and go out to the hedgerows and bring them in. I want them in my house. God is inclusive of everyone who will believe and who will repent. He also tells us two or three different parables that there will be a time when the door is shut. And outside there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that's red letters too. Yes, Jesus is full of love and mercy and grace, but he's also holy and righteous. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He will never let sin go unpunished. He will always punish sin. But he loves us enough that he says, I'm willing to take your punishment. And if you'll put your faith into what I did for you to take your punishment, you won't have to suffer it. But if you don't, you're still condemned. There's a final warning in the book of Revelation. It's Revelation 22, 19. I think you got that one. If anyone takes words away from this scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person any share in the tree of life and the holy city which are described in this scroll. Pretty strong warning. Right after this, he says, the one who testifies to this says, I am coming soon. I'm coming soon. Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Don't let anyone deceive you with hollow philosophies that depend on human tradition and the teachings of man, on the prevailing science of the age, the elemental spiritual things of the world. The world telling us why good and bad happens and what good and bad is. That's elemental spiritual. It's the world defining good and bad. It's the world defining good and evil. It's the world defining what is sin and what is righteous and what is holy. And the world cannot do it. Don't be taken captive by that deceptive philosophy. Don't let anyone deceive you with a fine sounding argument. Rather, 
What did it say? Just as we came into to Christ, also live that same way. Believe the word of the Lord. Trust in it. Hold fast to it. Stand firm in it to the end. And in so doing, receive a crown of glory. A, a crown of glory. Would you stand with me this morning? I know that's hard. Hard for me to say. It's hard to hear too. But it's true. It's true. And in understanding that, you know what we get a greater appreciation for? Come on up. We, we get an appreciation, a greater appreciation for what we've been saved from. We've been saved from the wrath of God, the just wrath of God. Because Jesus took his wrath on him. Without that, we don't even understand why he did what he did. I'm thankful. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's true. Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God is how we are to live. As people, as families, as as the church. If we will live that way, Lord, you will bless it. So, Lord, protect us. Just like I prayed over the little kids as they were sitting here. Protect them spiritually, their hearts and their minds, Lord. We need that too. As we hear your truth. In Jesus' name.